I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 11, and I'm going to be talking about the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before I jump into Isaiah 11, I want to tell you this verse in Psalm 27, 13, where David says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed, unless he had faith that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You see, one of these days, you're going to faint unless you believe you're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. No matter what you're going through right now, you can mark it down if you're saved you can mark it down. You're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You're going to visibly see him, look at him, touch him, hear him face to face. And that's what Isaiah 11 is talking about. The millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect reign. We find the Lord Jesus Christ on every single page. So Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11 and verse 1 it says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. First off, let's look at the first point here. The first point I got wrote down is rod of iron. The Lord Jesus Christ is a rod of iron. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. Revelation 19 and verse 15. It says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. Isaiah 11.4 says this, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. You see, he's going to be the one judging. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. In Revelation 19.15, it says, And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. He's going to smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. It's the word. The rod of his mouth is the word of authority. And he will execute perfect judgment this way. He will rule with the rod of iron. And it says... Back there in Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Why does it say out of Jesse? Well, because when it comes to Jesus Christ showing up in the flesh, Jesus is from the line of David, who is the son of Jesse. So Jesus Christ is the rod out of the stem of Jesse. Matthew 1, 1 shows you the... Genealogy, genealogy of the Lord Jesus, and it says in Matthew 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. It says in Revelation twenty two sixteen that he is the root and the offspring of David. It says in Romans 1, 3, Paul said, and was made of the seed of David, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So when it comes to the flesh, Jesus Christ is of the line of David. He's, he's, the, he's the rod out of the stem of Jesse. See, you find Jesus on every page. David is from the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is called the line of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49.10 said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter signifies the authority that the king has, that, that rod that he has that signifies his authority. And the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah. He's the rod of the stem of Jesse. Jesse is the tree. Jesus Christ is the branch. And there shall come forth a rod of the stem of Jesse and a branch Isaiah 11, 1, a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. So the branch is the Lord Jesus. And you contrast this with the, an abominable branch, as it's called a few chapters over. 
Isaiah fourteen nineteen. It says, But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Talking about the devil over there in Isaiah 14. The devil and the Antichrist. So Jesus Christ is the righteous branch. And Jesus Christ is the tree of life. You know, back there, uh, Adam and Eve, they took off the wrong tree. What would have happened if they turned down the wrong tree? Most likely they would have got the opportunity to eat off the tree of life and live forever by partaking off the tree. Well, we, got, we had the opportunity to do the same thing ourselves, and we chose to eat off the right tree. If you got saved, that's what you did. You chose to partake of the tree of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the rod of iron. And there shall come forth out of the rod, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So, that's the next thing. The millennial kingdom isn't just going to have a rod of iron. It's going to be a righteous rule. You know why? Because the Lord has everything needed for a perfect rulership, for Him to be the most perfect ultimate ruler. He has everything needed. And you see everything that's needed right here. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. He is the Holy Spirit incarnate. The Spirit of wisdom. Well, he is wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom. Jesus Christ is wisdom. Over there in Proverbs 8, verse 12, it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty, witty inventions. So it's talking about wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. And that was Proverbs eight twelve. You get down to verse 23. It says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. So, the Lord Jesus Christ is wisdom. And since he's wisdom, it says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is wisdom. Over there in Luke eleven thirty one. It says, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, you know this. The most wisest man in the Bible was who? King Solomon. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say when he showed up? A greater than Solomon is here, referring to himself. He is the spirit of wisdom. You look at Matthew thirteen thirty four. Matthew 13 and verse 34. It says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. He was uttering things that had been kept secret from the foundation of the world. You look in 1 Kings 3, 11 through 13. 1 Kings 3, 11 through 13. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, this is God talking to Solomon, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and not asked 
for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So, God gave Solomon wisdom that nobody before him or after him could even compare to. But when Jesus Christ showed up in Luke eleven thirty one, he said, A greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus Christ is wisdom. He's the spirit of wisdom. Also, the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters, coinciding with the 66 books of the Bible. I've been here and there naming, naming off how these chapters line up with the, that certain book of the Bible. Uh, so we're in chapter 11, and you got 1 Kings, which is the 11th book of the Bible. And who shows up in 1 Kings? King Solomon. King Solomon's reign pictures Jesus Christ's reign in the millennium. Because when Solomon was reigning, there was peace on every side. When Solomon was reigning, he was the wisest king the world had ever seen. When Jesus Christ reigns, it's going to be the wisest king the world has ever seen. So Solomon takes... He starts his reign in 1 Kings. Chapter 11 talks about the millennial kingdom where the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. So the chapters, they line up. And it's talking about wisdom here. It talks about wisdom just like 1 Kings talks about Solomon getting wisdom. So it's a righteous rule. The Lord has everything needed for a perfect rulership. He's the Spirit of the Lord. Holy Spirit incarnated. He's wisdom. He is wisdom. Uh, and then it says, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. You don't just need wisdom, you also need understanding. And Job 28, 28 this defines understanding. It says, and unto man, he said, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So, you think about wisdom, that's using correctly what you know. You think about understanding. If you've got understanding, you not only use correctly what you know, but you know how what you know relates to God, so that you depart from evil. Like, you could know all the facts about the Bible, but if you don't have any understanding, it's not going to do you any good. You're not going to depart from evil. You're not going to be conscious that a God wrote all those facts of the Bible. So therefore, you're not going to depart from evil. You're just going to see it as a bunch of facts. You might even have a little bit of wisdom and use some of the facts you pick up from the Bible to help your day-to-day -day life and help you in this life only. But if you don't have understanding, you're not going to depart from evil. You're not going to see how it relates to God, and it's not going to do you any good in the hereafter. You don't have any understanding. You see, the devil, he's got a lot of knowledge. He's got way more knowledge than us. He was wiser than Daniel, but he didn't have any understanding. He didn't depart from evil. So you got knowledge, that's what you know. You got wisdom, that's using correctly what you know. And then you got understanding. You know how what you know relates to God. You t always take it back to God. And when you always take it back to God, you depart from evil. You need all three. Knowledge is the least important one. So the spirit of wisdom 
and understanding the spirit of counsel. Well, what's he called in Isaiah 9, 6? A wonderful counselor. He's the wonderful counselor. And Romans eleven thirty four says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Nobody. You can't counsel God. You can't give God advice. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? He should be your counselor. So it says, The spirit of counsel and might. What is he called in Isaiah 9, 6? Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Self-Proclaimed Almighty. In Revelation chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is knowledge. He's wisdom, He's knowledge, He's understanding. It says, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge. He's got all the knowledge. He's all-knowing. There's nothing you can tell him that he didn't already know. Nothing ever just occurred to God. He already knew it. And then it, so in Isaiah 11, 2, it says, The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. Look at this, who in the days of his flesh, and now that's key, in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So, he was heard in that he feared. The Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, in the days of his flesh, gave you that pattern to fear God. He was, he was heard in that he feared. He gave you the pattern to go by, fear God. He is God, but he gave you the pattern to go by, fear God. And he's going to have the fear of the Lord. Imagine having a perfect dictator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You've never had that. You've never seen that. You never had a president that feared the Lord, especially not like this. So it's a righteous rule. It's a perfect righteous rule. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. It's going to be a righteous rule. Now look at verse 3. It says, And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of, the, after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. He doesn't need the sight of his eyes. He doesn't need the hearing of his ears. He already knew it. He ha he's got supernatural senses. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. And he can judge that way. You see, man judges with the sight of the eyes and the hearing of the ears. They can look at somebody and think that they look better than somebody else, so they choose the person that they think looks better. They judge by the hearing of the ears. A sweet talker could fool a human judge but not the perfect judge, not the judge of all the earth. You can't fool him. So it's not about sight. It's not about hearing. The Lord won't judge by appearance. In John seven twenty four, it says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You see, the Lord's going to have righteous judgment. What does it say back there in 1 Samuel 16, 7? Look at 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. 
So it ain't about judging after the sight of the eyes. It's not about reproving after the hearing of the ears. His power goes way beyond this. He's going to have no respect of persons in judgment. Man has respect of persons when they judge. In Proverbs 24, 23, it says, These things also belong to the wise. Jesus Christ is wisdom. It says, It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. And see, when all you got is the sight of the eyes and the hearing of the ears in judgment, you're going to eventually have respect of persons. But he's not judging with the sight of the eyes and hearing of the ears. It's a righteous rule. That's what you can look forward to. Look at verse 4, Isaiah eleven four. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the poor. He will judge properly concerning the poor. He'll judge properly concerning the meek because he can't be bought by the rich. It's all his. He can't be bought. If, you know, the devil tried to buy him. In Matthew 4, he said, I'll give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. The devil couldn't even buy him. You think you're going to buy him? You think somebody out there is going to buy him? He's not going to be bought. So it's not going to matter if you're rich or poor. It says, with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He's going to be reproving those rich people that didn't treat the poor and the meek people right. He's going to reprove with equity. Equity the is impartial distribution of justice. It's going to be, the ground's going to be level. No big shots. It, you got a poor man here, a rich man here. Whichever one's wrong, the Lord's going to say they're wrong. Whichever one's right, the Lord's going to say they're right. The ground will be level. No big shots. His second coming is going to bring in this righteous rule. So, but, so it says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Now here's the second coming. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. Just like I read you in Revelation 19.15. Where out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. And then it says, And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So he will smite with his mouth. Revelation 19.15. Fire comes from his word. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. Remember what it says. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's going to consume the Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth. He's going to open his mouth and he's going to be breathing fire and it's going to burn them all up. Second Thessalonians 1 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when he comes to set up his righteous rule. Now look at verse 5. Isaiah eleven five. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So the girdle shows readiness, and righteousness is his preparation. Look at Isaiah 61, verse 11. It says, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. It's going to be all about righteousness, a righteous rule. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. 
I mean, that's what he's going to put on. Righteousness. That's what he has on. And faithfulness. The girdle of his reins. You don't know any ruler that's faithful to what they say. They all lie just to get elected. And they go back and forth with it. One time they're for this. One time they're against this. The next time they're for that. The next time they're against that. But this is the faithful witness. With righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Look at verse 6 now. Isaiah eleven six, And this will get us into the next point, talking about the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom will be rest to all. So it's a rod of iron. It's a righteous rule. And three, it's rest to all. Rest to everything and rest to everybody. It says in Isaiah eleven six, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now that is a very famous millennial kingdom verse. And a lot of people that believe in the, the Mandela effect believe that this has been changed. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they believe the Mandela effect or whatever it is that the Bible has changed along with many other things. But that's all a bunch of non nonsense because even if the Mandela effect were real, God can preserve His Word even through the Mandela effect. So we don't believe that. And... It's going to be rest to all. You see, when Jesus Christ paid the payment for sin on the cross and paid the price for the curse, He wore a crown of thorns. You see that? He, he wore a crown of thorns. Remember back there in Genesis where, where God told Adam, He says, thorns and thistles. Shall it bring forth to thee? Talking about the ground. And that's what Jesus Christ wore on his head, a crown of thorns, because he became the curse. And when he died on the cross, he purchased animals, he purchased man, and he purchased the ground because of that crown of thorns. He bought it all. And we all came from the ground. Genesis one twenty four. Look at Genesis one twenty four. Genesis one twenty four says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. It said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature. So when God wore that crown of thorns and died on the cross, he purchased the animals. He purchased the ground. He put that crown of thorns on. And we all know what man was formed out of. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. We all, go, we all go back to the ground. The Lord purchased the ground. Genesis 3.18, along with that curse, came the thorns and thistles. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Jesus put on that crown of thorns, and he purchased, showing he was purchasing it all, even animals, even man, even the ground itself. It's all he is. But you look at these animals. It talks about in Isaiah 11. 
like the wolf, like the leopard, like the lion, like the bear. Now those animals are used to picture evil men, evil spirits, like the wolf, for example. In Matthew 10 and verse 16, Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Or like in Acts 20.29, 20, in Acts 20.29, 20, He said, For I know this, Paul said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So the wolves are compared to evil men. You think about the leopard compared to the Antichrist, used to illustrate the Antichrist. And Daniel, it says, After this I beheld and lo, another like a leopard. You remember that verse in that study? And then in Revelation 13, you look at Revelation 13, and the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. And then here's the bear, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. There's your lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So you see, those animals are vicious animals used to illustrate evil men, evil spirits, the devil himself. A lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The lion rips up that uh, young prophet in 1 Kings 13, 29 that was, that was led astray by the old prophet. You think about the bear used to illustrate the Antichrist. A bear ate up the children that were calling Elijah, saying, go up thou bald head. Remember that? And then you think about the asp in Isaiah eleven eight, the asp and the cockatrice. Both of those are serpents. And you think about the serpents in the scriptures, Genesis three, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So you got these vicious animals, but look at this. The wolf, a vicious animal, used to illustrate vicious men, evil spirits, shall lie down with the lamb. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. That's the way it's going to be in the millennial kingdom. They're not going to be trying to come at their throat anymore. They're not going to be trying to rip them up anymore. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. They're going to be vegetarians. They're going to eat grass like the ox. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid like a, a kid as in a goat. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. So a little child, you know, you could look in the millennium, you could look out the window and see your little child out there uh, leading a wolf or a leopard or a young lion, petting them, cuddling with them, picking them up. And it would be no problem. You know, some people, I see some people today, and they take pictures of their child, or their, even their baby, next to a vicious pit bull, or next to a, a big giant pet snake. And I'm thinking, that would be all right, but it's in the wrong dispensation. They're not in the millennium yet. But in the millennium, you know, you could get close to a snake. You could let your baby get close to a snake. You could let your baby get close to a vicious pit bull. But that's in a di this is in a different dispensation here. God's not took that curse away from the animals. You see, when, when Adam and Eve messed up, it messed up everything. It even messed up the animals. So those same animals that are used to illustrate vicious people, evil spirits, they're no longer going to be vicious animals anymore. You'll be able to have your own pet wolf, your own pet leopard, your own pet bear, your own pet serpent. That's the way it's going to be in the millennial kingdom. You'll be able to 
go along with any animal you want. And that's going to be an even big, bigger difference because this is going to happen right after the tribulation. And in the tribulation, the animals get way more vicious. And over there in Revelation, the beasts of the earth are even used to take out a bunch of men. In Revelation 6, 8, it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that stood on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So you see, the beasts of the earth are going to be even more beastly during the tribulation, but then in the millennium, the Lord's going to come down, He's going to take away the curse, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. It's going to be a completely different story. The animals will no longer be meat eaters. It's going to go back to like a pre-flood diet. You see, back before the flood, we know that back before the flood, it says in Genesis 9, 3 through 4, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So before Genesis nine, um, they were didn't they didn't have uh, they were just like vegetarians. So it's going to go back to being that way, and you're not going to have to worry about the animals coming and trying to eat you. You're not going to have to worry about the animals attacking you, attacking your kids. It's going to go back to like it was before. I mean, how do you think, you know, you think about Adam naming the animals. He wouldn't have been able to get close to a lot of them. If they were like they were today, he would have got eaten. But he was able to get close to them because, just like it says here, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So Adam could go right up to that lion because that lion didn't want to eat Adam. It just wanted to eat straw like the ox. Then go to verse 9, Isaiah eleven nine. It says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's an amazing statement. The earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You think about how much water's out there. Miles and miles and miles long, miles and miles deep. That's as amazing as God telling Abraham that his seed is going to be as the sand of the sea and as the stars of heaven. And you think about it today. There's not much knowledge of the Lord, but during that time, there's going to be knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Full of the knowledge of the Lord. I mean, you think about Israel itself. In Hebrews 8.10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. He's going to put his laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. He's going to put their laws. He's going to put his laws in their mind. He's going to write them in their hearts. And it says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. They're all going to know who the Lord is. They're going to be able to look at him and visibly see him and touch him, just like they was when he was walking around in the flesh in the Gospels. It's going to be a physical, visible kingdom. You'll be able to see him. You know, in Hebrews it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not going to be about so much about faith like it is now, where we walk by faith, not by sight. 
obviously there's still going to be faith, but it's going to be a lot more of sight. You're going to be seeing him. You're going to be seeing all this stuff. You're going to be seeing millions and millions of saints like us walking around in glorified bodies. You're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ himself on a throne that just took over the world. Israel is going to have the law in their mind wrote down in their hearts. You're going to have born-again believers walking around everywhere that is going to have a mind like the Lord. You know, we're going to know as we're known. And you're going to have animals with the curse lifted. You're going to have the Lord Himself will be teaching the nations. Micah 4.2 It says, And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. So they're going to go to a physical place and see, visibly see, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's going to teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the whole world as the waters cover the sea. You're not going to have to go up to somebody and say, can I tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ? They're already going to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's so true that if you actually do prophesy, then you get killed for it. And the verse is slipping me off the top of my... I, I usually know it off the top of my head, but I can't think of it off the top of my head in Zechariah where if somebody prophesies, their father and mother... Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, Zechariah 13.3. It says, And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. And for the context, you go back to verse 2, and it shall come to pass in that day. Saith the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. There's not going to be any idols in the millennium. And they shall no more be remembered. And I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So, no more false prophets. No more unclean spirits. No unclean spirits during this time. You go over there to Revelation 20, it shows you that during this millennial kingdom, the devil is put into a bottomless pit. So there's no, you know, the Lord's going to be teaching people. They're going to, like Micah 4, 2 said, they're going to come and they're going to hear the word of the Lord, word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And there's going to be no foul of the air coming down to steal it out of people's heart. Because that foul, that devil, he's bound up in the bottomless pit. And his unclean spirits are passed out of the land. The earth's going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You think about taking all that resistance away to the word of the Lord. It's going to be, everybody's going to be completely receptive. I mean, there's still going to be, obviously, some people that will not go along with the Lord. Obviously, I know that. But it's going to be a lot more receptive than it is now. And, there, I mean, there's still going to be some people that rebel. They don't like the righteous rule. So they're going to be the ones that joined that army that's as the sand of the sea. That, we well, see, the devil's going to get loosed out of the bottom of the spit at the end of the millennium. And he gets an army as the sand of the sea. And they go against the Lord. But then fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. And it's just over as quick as it began. But the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. It says they will not hurt nor destroy in on my holy mountain. So no fear of terrorists, no fear of mass shooters, no fear of sex traffickers. You know, I've got to where everywhere I go, I've I got to watch my kids to make sure some pervert doesn't snatch them up. What kind of world are we in 
when a mom can take her kid to Walmart and then she leaves Walmart without her kid because some pervert stole them. How could some pervert come and steal a child out of a buggy and that child that morning was in its bed safe with his parents, but then that evening it was taken, and now it's only God knows where it is. That's the world we're living in. There's going to be no more of that. They're not going to hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, it says. No more, no more gang violence, no more thieves. It's going to be the Lord with a righteous rule. It's going to be rest to all. And they're going to have millions and millions of believers and glorified bodies patrolling the place. You're not going to see anybody hurting or destroying in all his holy mountain. I mean, the devil and an army as the sand of the sea can't even take it over. Revelation 20 and verse 9. The devil himself and an army as the sand of the sea try to come up against the city, and look what happens in Revelation 20 and verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So if the devil and an army as the sand of the sea can't hurt nor destroy in all his holy mountain, hey, you're good. The earth's going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Isaiah eleven ten, it says, and in that day, note the phrase, always note that phrase, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, once again, the Lord Jesus Christ is the root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, an ensign like a flag or a symbol for something, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. You see, it's Rest to all. And it says, To it shall the Gentiles seek. You see, like I said, Micah 4 2, those nations are going to come and they're going to hear the Lord. They're going to hear the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he's going to teach them of his ways. And you see, Isaiah is teaching that. The Gentiles are going to go to Jesus Christ for rest and peace during that time, during that time of the millennium. But the Apostle Paul, he shows you that you can use spiritual application because he spiritually applies this verse to the church in Romans fifteen twelve. Because you see, during the church age, it's primarily Gentiles coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the most part, the Jews are blind to the gospel. So right now it's primarily Gentiles coming to the Lord Jesus Christ during this church age time period we're in. So Paul spiritually applies this verse to the church age in Romans fifteen twelve, where it says, And again, Esaias, which is Isaiah, Esaias saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So you see, he, he spiritually applies it to us today. But Isaiah Doctrinally speaking, it's talking about the millennium where the Gentiles themselves are going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for rest and peace. And like I said, Solomon's reign pictures the millennium. And you, it, when you look at 1 Kings, which 1 Kings, the 11th book of the Bible, will line up with Isaiah chapter 11 because the 66 chapters of Isaiah go along with the 66 books of the Bible. You go over to 1 Kings 10.1 and look what happens. Solomon's on the throne and he's well known around the world. And it says in 1 Kings 10.1, And the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions. So this Gentile, this queen of Sheba, comes to hear Solomon, travels to hear him. Just like in the millennium, Gentiles are going to come to hear the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And 1 Kings 10.7 says, 
The Queen of Sheba says, Howbeit I believe not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. And that's, the, that's going to be their reaction when they hear it. They, they're going to see it. It's a visible, physical thing, not some spiritual thing. It's a visible, physical thing. Now, if we get into verse 11, and this will be our last point. The points we talked about, the Lord Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron in the millennium. It's a righteous rule. It's rest to all. It's rest to man, animals, everything. And then the fourth thing is it's a, reco a recovered remnant. So it says in Isaiah eleven eleven, And it shall come to pass in that day, there's your phrase again, the in that day phrase puts you in the context of the second coming and the millennium. The millennium is a 1,000 year reign of the Lord Jesus. And a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, the second time, to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So, this is a recovered remnant, and they're gathered together. This is Israel. Verse 12, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So the remnant return from a worldwide dispersion. And that just like you read over in Matthew 24, he's going to gather together the elect. The elect there is not talking about me and you, the elect. It's talking about Israel, the elect. There's going to be a believing remnant. Now, when you start talking about this, you got these guys out there that think you're saying that just because a Jew is a Jew physically, that that means he's saved or right with God. That's not what we're saying. There's going to be a believing, believing remnant of Jews, believing Israel, that's going to be gathered together. And verse 13 says, The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. Now remember, when it says Ephraim, it's calling the northern kingdom Israel. It's referring to them as Ephraim. Let me explain this to you again in case you forgot. So back when, you know, Solomon had, had was reigning, and when Solomon was reigning, both Israel and Judah were together. It was a, it was not a divided kingdom. They were all all of Israel was under Solomon. But then after Solomon, he had a son named Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was king. And Rehoboam listened to the bad advice of his young friends and didn't listen to the advice of his the older guys. And this eventually led to the splitting of the kingdom. So instead of being one kingdom like it was under Solomon, it was split. And most of the kingdom goes to this other guy, this wicked king named Jeroboam. He gets ten of the tribes while... Rehoboam only got two of them, Judah and Benjamin. And when it says Ephraim, when it refers to Ephraim here, it's referring to the northern kingdom, which is Israel, not Judah. This, so it says, The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off, now look at this, Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So under the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteous rule, it's no longer going to be the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It's no longer going to be Israel and Judah. It's no longer going to be Ephraim and Judah. It's going to be they're all one again. They're all, it's all just one kingdom, and they're under the Lord Jesus Christ. 
just like under the righteous rule, or not, but under the peaceful rule of Solomon. That's the way it's going to be under the righteous rule of the Lord Jesus. And see, back in 1 Kings 4.25, like I said, Isaiah 11 will match up with 1 Kings. And in 1 Kings 4.25, it says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So just like Solomon's reign, the Lord Jesus Christ reign, you're going to have Judah and Israel safely together, not going against each other. The recovered remnant that comes through into the millennium, they're going to be all together. The two major divisions of Israel after the Rehoboam and Jeroboam ordeal, they're no longer going to be divided. They will reunite under the Lord in the millennium. It says in Isaiah eleven fourteen, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab. And the children of Ammon shall obey them. So Israel will be the dominant political force, obviously, because the Lord Jesus Christ at the head. And the Lord shall des utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. Dry shod means they go over it without getting their feet wet, because the Lord dries it up with a mighty wind, just like he does back there in Exodus 14, when he splits the, when he parts the Red Sea, just like he did for Elijah and Elisha, Back there when he parted it, parted the waters. You know, he, the Lord can take a mighty wind and just part the waters and make it not even be muddy where the water was. He gets it so dry. They go over dry shot. And you see, during the tribulation, like in Revelation 16, 12, the Euphrates River gets dried up so that those armies can gather together easier against the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it says in verse 16, And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So there's, he, he dries up the waters and it makes a highway. It's a, it's a highway for the returning remnant. A highway that will connect Assyria and Egypt and Israel. Isaiah 19, 23 through 25. Isaiah 19, 23 through 25. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. So he dries up some water, makes that highway. In Revelation 16, you got where he dried up that Euphrates River, made it easier for the people to, to gather together against him at the second coming. So you got a recovered remnant. You've got rest to all. You've got a righteous rule. And you got a rod of iron. It's the millennial kingdom. And I don't even cover an inch of all the stuff that the Bible talks about when it talks about the millennium. But that could be a good start for you to whet your appetite and make you want to study into the millennial kingdom a little bit more. But that'll be all for Isaiah chapter 11.